When your baby dies suddenly, and for no apparent reason, your life is turned upside down. A recent paper in the BMJ stirred up a national controversy amongst parents and healthcare professionals. Lucy Chapel refereed that paper. When the paper came out, she was an expectant mother herself. When I had my first baby, in common with lots of other mothers, I would go and check my girl, night after night after night. There's always a bit of you, particularly as a first-time mother, that doesn't trust yourself, that doesn't quite believe that your little precious baby will be OK through the night. I'm a mother of two children and I'm going to be a mother again soon to this baby. And I want to know what I could do to minimise the risk of sudden infant death syndrome. There has been research on sudden infant death syndrome uh, for many years now, since really sort of the 70s and 80s. But this study is interesting because it's really big and definitive and it's from arguably one of the world's best research teams on this question. The stakes couldn't be higher in this area. The way Peter Fleming and his team handle the research and the publication is an object lesson in how to do it right. When I came to Bristol in the late 70s, there was a small group of babies, probably two or three times a week at that time, I'd become aware of a baby somewhere in the region who died suddenly and unexpectedly. Uh, and we didn't really understand what was going on. We had no idea what was causing these deaths. But gradually, certain patterns started to emerge, and we then needed to look at what was the difference between the babies who died and the rest of the population. And to our astonishment, came up with some very, very powerful observations. The Utterly unexpected one that babies sleeping on their front were nearly ten times as likely to die as those sleeping on their back. The perhaps more expected one, which related to the effect of parents smoking uh, and the effect of babies getting too warm, which was really where I'd come from in terms of understanding the physiology. So it led us to a much deeper understanding, really driven by what the parents had asked us to do. Cod death is comparatively rare, but there are few things more tragic. Recent research has shown that if babies are laid down to sleep on their back or side, the risk of cot death can be greatly reduced. The Department of Health's new leaflet explains how anyone who looks after a young baby can help reduce the risk of cot death. Please call free on 0800 100 160 at any time for a free leaflet. What happened after the initial back to sleep campaign was this dramatic fall in numbers of deaths. The numbers of cot deaths across the country and indeed in every other country where a similar campaign has happened fell by about 60 or 70 percent. Now the challenging task was to design a trial to identify the remaining less obvious factors linked to sudden infant death. What it is is a prospective population based case control study so we have a population of about 5 million people living in our region and we tried to identify every unexpected infant death that occurred. And indeed, we identified almost 99% of them. About a half of those deaths were actually fully explained. The other half, which were the sudden infant deaths, we were able to say, first off, we've identified pretty well all of them. So it's not that we've missed some and they may be different. So that was very important. The second was getting there very, very quickly. Our visits to the home were the first visit after the baby had died. These weren't visits weeks or months later. These were usually just an hour or two afterwards. We visited with the police, but we led the investigation as healthcare professionals with a primary role of caring for the family, but a secondary role of collecting information and with the family's full consent. The families were enthusiastic about telling a healthcare professional what had happened. And the really dramatic thing that occurred was that when we took a history from the family initially, perhaps in the emergency room, we'd get a description of what had happened. When we did the same thing with the families in the room where the events had occurred, the difference in the quality of information was staggering. It's very hard. You know, the, the, the whole issue of what do you do, how do you talk to a family whose child has just died? Having been there and having spoken to families and having got that experience of learning how, you know, what families want and how they are, 
I won't say it gets easier, it doesn't, it's never easy. It's one of the hardest things that anyone can ever do. But one can see that actually what we do has some value to the family, supporting, working with them, caring for them, showing them that people are actually interested, that they matter, and that we're not there to criticise or to, to, to attack them, but there to support them. So what we've been able to do in this series of studies is to identify some of the very subtle things which really we couldn't have picked up 20 years ago, even if we'd asked the right questions, because they were being swamped by some of the bigger effects. The paper confirmed as risk factors, babies slipping under the covers, the use of pillows, overheating, parental drinking, smoking, drugs, and bottle feeding. It was the related findings about co-sleeping that caused so much controversy. We found that more than half of the babies who died had been sharing a sleep surface with a parent. That may be, it may be a bed or it may be a sofa, but certainly sleeping with a parent. And the striking finding was that if babies were sharing a firm bed, were not heavily wrapped, parents had not been taking alcohol or drugs and were non-smokers, we didn't find any difference in the prevalence of that practice between the babies who died and the controls in the rest of the population. In other words, it wasn't that practice that was the risk. What we found was that if babies were sleeping on a sofa with a parent, the risk was 25 to 30 times as high, and sleeping on a sofa was very rare indeed amongst our control families. In fact, we only had one out of all, any of the control families at any time we ever did this. So sleeping on a sofa was a real high-risk behaviour Secondly, alcohol. Parents who'd taken more than two units of alcohol or who'd taken drugs that might affect conscious level or parents who were smokers, and it doesn't mean smoking in bed, but smoking at all. And any combination of those factors pushed the risk up hugely. So in other words, it wasn't having the baby next to you on a firm bed that was the risk. It was the interaction between baby and mother or baby and father related perhaps to drugs, alcohol or tobacco. We also found that for the sofa sharing, this was a huge risk regardless of whether parents had taken anything else. But for bed sharing, having the baby in the bed, it was the other things that went along with it, particularly the drugs, alcohol and tobacco, that turned what is a normal human behaviour into a risky human behaviour. There was no effect of mother's alcohol or drug intake if the baby was sleeping in a cot. It had an effect if the baby was sharing a sleep surface with her. Uh, the tobacco is different. The cigarette smoke has an effect regardless because it's pervasive. Everyone's initial thought would be that it's a parent rolling over and suffocating the baby. But the, the authors suggest that it's not as simple as that. Because of the nature of the investigations we did, when we were there so soon afterwards, looking at both the baby, the parent and the circumstances, we were able to investigate that possibility in more detail than has ever been possible before, and we found no evidence of it. What we think is happening from all of those uh, effects of drug, alcohol or tobacco is that complex interaction is interfered with. The impairment of that responsiveness puts the baby at risk. This paper is important because it can help to confirm and extend the advice that's already being given to parents. There is plenty of advice out there. There's some excellent websites that are particularly run by charities and campaigning organisations. And concerned parents or parents-to-be have no shortage of advice on how to avoid the, the, the extremely rare event of their baby dying. If you look at all of the recommended practice that's in the current advice sheets in the UK and in fact in most other countries, every one of those has come out of studies such as ours. We are all given the pregnancy book and the question is does a mother read this? I did with my first and I will certainly refer to it again. I might be a doctor and an academic but I need common sense advice that is written well. It talks about putting the baby to sleep on his or her back don't let anyone smoke in the same room as your baby, and all the other advice that has come out of the research that Peter Fleming's group has been instrumental in leading. If we go public and say, you know, don't share a bed with your baby at all, the people who listen to that are the well-educated, breastfeeding, 
health conscious, appropriate environment providing parents, those families are not at risk of losing their baby. If we just tell them, don't ever bring your baby into bed, many of them will follow that information, even though for them it's irrelevant. The group who won't follow the, that information, if we give it in that format, are the young, single, deprived mums living in awful circumstances who are just struggling to stay alive, to keep things going. They haven't got time and space in their lives to take on healthcare messages. Even with this research, there will be parents who lose a baby and they think, well, not, none of those factors apply to me, so what was the cause in my child? And that's hard on parents. You know, the one thing the families repeatedly have said over the last 30 years is don't let my baby have died in vain. Find out what it was.